Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Sadia, should I go ahead and start? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, great. Um, this is my first time doing one of these Friday reflections. So I'm not a, a, a public speaker. So I hope everyone will excuse me for any mistakes I might make. Um, this is a topic that I am really excited to speak about. I'm really passionate about. Um, and I hope, you know, everyone can maybe learn something, uh, take some take some things away so so to focus on so i wanted to just start with um salam alaikum everybody bismillah rahman rahim my name is zayna Pader. um i am by profession a city planner uh i've also gone through the certification process with the texas master naturalists um to study you know nature in central texas i'm a mom and um I'm also a former forest school teacher. Um, a few years ago during COVID, um, I ran a forest school co-op for one year with um, children ages two to six. So these are some of my experiences coming into this. And the topic that I'm focusing on today is um, our relationship as humans with nature and some of the the problems that exist and um you know some some ways we can look at this so when i say nature you know i think uh, a lot of different things might come up um you know we hear a lot about the environmental movement and we hear a lot about um saving the environment right and um a lot of times you know we're told that we need to recycle our plastic and drive a tesla and this is our our role and our um, duty to the earth. And that's sort of the way things are usually presented to us. Um, but I want to sort of approach it from a different way and just and talk about not just the environment and its degradation, but nature itself um, and how we think of it. So today in, in the generation that most of us grew up in, especially I think as uh, if you like me, you're an immigrant Muslim, um, you know, who's a second generation in America, you probably, I would say, did not have a very close relationship with nature growing up. A lot of people, um, you know, from our communities tend to not uh, have spent a lot of time outdoors. And so when I say nature, I mean, you know, going out in the woods, hiking, um, going to areas that are, um, you know, truly natural or undisturbed. And so we don't always have that experience. Um, and then for those of us who do, um, the sad news is, unfortunately, uh, not a lot of people are passing that on to their children. And so more than at any other time in human history, children are spending the least amount of time outdoors and in nature. And so uh, this is a big problem. And so I wanted to start talking a little about where we as humans are kind of stand today. And so, you know, in this century, we're, what we're looking at is that probably by the year 2050, two thirds of humans are going to be living in an urban environment. Um, and I'm a city planner. And so, you know, I, I, I deal with that. I, you know, I deal with land development um, and, you know, and, and, and cities are important and they play a huge role. But I think what we have to remember is that the more we're getting into cities, there's a lot of issues that come with capitalism and exploitation. That, that's a whole other topic, right? But um, there, that promotes this disconnection, right? So between uh, not just being in cities, but the way cities are starting to develop, especially in the United States. Um, development just sort of happens based on what is profitable and how much people can extract from the land, you know, based on the regulations that allow. Um, it's not done in a way that where the question the developer would first ask themselves is, is what I'm doing good for the land and good for the earth? What are the long-term implications, right? That's, that's not a question that really comes up for them. Um, you know, if there's a a regulation in place, um, then they might think about, uh, you know, how they can, you know, do an environmental assessment or things like that. So we also have uh, in this time an increase in technology, right? We have cars, right? That's changed um, the way cities are made. That's changed the way we live our lives. And obviously that's contributed to pollution and all kinds of things. And there's a technology of just us being on our phones and our computers and so um, 
caught up in these uh, busy cycles of work and other things and just, you know, in our devices that that's also something that's promoted that disconnect that we have from nature, right? So we have our lifestyles, technology, life in cities, right? All of these things have pulled us away. And so, uh, you know, how many times in one week do we normally go out and experience nature? I, I would say for most of us, it's probably not very often, right? And I'm not talking about the parking lot. I'm not talking about the landscaping, right? Um, things of that nature. So, um, and one of the things that happens and as part of our disconnect, I would argument argue is that when we start knowing nature um, scientifically, like this is really important, you know, learning about nature from a science perspective is important, but in a way it almost, it sort of promotes that disconnect because then you start to sort of, think of nature in this very abstract form, and you don't really think of it as something that's intimately connected to you. So I wanted to read a, a little um, excerpt from an article called On the Wildness of Children by Carol Black. It's one of my favorite essays. I would highly recommend it. Um, and so this is a, a small excerpt from that where she, where she writes, a free child outdoors will learn the flat stones that the crayfish hide under the still and shady pools where the big trout rest and the rocky slopes where the wild berries grow. They will learn the patterns in the waves and which tree branches can bear their weight, which twigs will catch fire and which plants have thorns. A child in school must learn what a biome is and how to use logarithms to calculate biodiversity. Most of them, of course, don't learn it um, and they forget it the day after the test. Um, our standards proclaim that children will understand the intricate workings of ecosystems, the principles of evolution and ad adaptation, but one in four children will end up leaving school not knowing that the earth revolved around the sun. A child who knows where to find wild berries will never forget this information. An uneducated person in the highlands of Papua New Guinea can recognize 70 species of birds by their songs. An illiterate shaman in the Amazon can identify hundreds of medicinal plants. An Aboriginal person from Australia carries in his memory a map of the land encoded in song that extends for a thousand miles. Our minds are evolved to contain vast amounts of information about the world that gave us birth and to pass this information along easily from one generation to the next. But to know the world, you have to live in the world. And this author, I'm still reading what the author is saying now. My daughters who did not go to school would sometimes watch as groups of school children re receive their prescribed dose of environmental education. On a sunny day along a rocky coastline, a mass of 14 year olds carrying clipboards wander aimlessly along the tide pools, trying not to get their shoes wet. Uh, looking at their worksheets more than the life teeming under their feet. A busload of nine year old erupts carrying slips of paper describing a treasure hunt where they have to find items found in nature and items not found in nature. We discover there are several plastic objects hidden by their teacher along the trail near the parking lot. Of course, they don't have time to walk the whole two miles into the waterfall. A middle school class nearby is herded indoors, given outdoors, given 10 minutes to watch birds and then told, up, told to come up with a scientific hypothesis and an experimental protocol for testing it. One of the boys proposes an experiment that involves nailing shut the beaks of wild ducks. Um, and I, I don't know if this excerpt is, is clear enough, but I mean, that the idea is that, you know, these kids are going outside, right? They're learning about nature. They're getting all this information, but they're not really learning about it, right? They're not really there. Um, there's almost like through learning about it in these worksheets, there's almost like a further disconnect that's being formed. Maybe it's kind of like, you know, um, like when you have a favorite novel that's like you just love and you read it, but then in school, someone you know like they prescribes it to the class and you have to answer all these questions and you see the other kids are like they hate it and you don't I don't know maybe this is just like a nerdy experience that I have but like I'm just like I wish like the teacher didn't do that because I feel like you're almost ruining the book and extracting the like the beauty out of it by like making it so pedantic anyways that's an aside but um so that's sort of like a western way of looking at, at knowledge and looking at even the idea of knowing things, um, which is a very different idea. Um, you know, what learning and knowing means, especially when it comes to nature and indigenous thoughts in a lot of different societies, is a very different idea. And so, um, you know, and, and I'll come back to that idea in a little bit. Um, uh, in Western thoughts, uh, you know, we've had periods um, 
where uh, this idea of a return to nature has come up um, in a lot of different places. I think they were called the transcendentalists um, who wrote and talked about it a lot at a time where the world was changing and a lot of, um, you know, uh, urban development and industrial development was happening and sort of ideas had started to come up about the return to nature, right? So you may have heard of um, Henry David Thoreau uh, who wrote the book Walden, you know, and it was all about, um, and, you know, and he was a, a well-known he's a philosopher he was a, a well-off guy but his uh, his his book is about how he got a cabin in the woods and and lived there away from everyone and how amazing that experience was now of course he wasn't you know really roughing it you know I, I'm pretty sure I think um his mom and his aunts would bring him food every week but the point point is it's a it's a it's a wonderful piece of writing about appreciating nature and things like that but um it is from that Western perspective, a little bit more of that, the idea of like, you know, I'm, I'm just discovering this and all that. Um, and then we have another uh, um, philosopher, writer at the time, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he also would write a lot about this. Um, there's one poem that I really love by him. I wanted to read a little excerpt from that. Um, I remember I read this in high school or middle school and it always stayed with me. I just thought it was such a beautiful a uh, way of phrasing this. So in this poem, he's talking about um, being out in the woods and away from his regular life. And he um, he says, in the wood, we return to reason and faith. There, I feel that nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. Uh, and the poem continues, but it's just a really beautiful image of where he's sort of standing in nature and he feels as if like, you know, his body slowly disappears. So he's maybe nothing but like one transparent eyeball, just sort of taking all of it in and sort of the idea of, um, spirituality and nature that you know that's been a, a theme of I think human thought for a long time um there is a amazing book of this idea of like a western versus indigenous ways of looking at nature interests you called braiding sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer um and it's amazing she's a biologist and a scientist um who has you know a native american background um in her ethnicity and her, her culture and so she grew up like loving and knowing nature when she became a biologist she just um noticed so many differences and like like she in this book she sort of she doesn't decry one or the other she doesn't say like being a biologist is a bad thing or she regrets it like she is happy that she learned those things and she's a scientist but it also is a very different way of knowing nature um the intimate connection she had from just being out in the world um, almost like that of a poet versus the way the scientists would look at things in a very black and white and sterile way, right? Um, you know, this is this and this is the use, uh, you know, you know, versus like um, I think how her father would describe the strawberries in the fields to her as um, having been waiting all night for her and, um, you know, meant to cure something and just a, like a very different um, way of looking at nature and a relationship. And it's really um, <clears throat> a really good book. I can't even begin to do it, do it justice. There's a lot in there. I would highly recommend it. Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, and so, you know, and it connects into this idea Islamically we have of our fitra. Um, and, you know, and if I say anything uh, from an Islamic perspective that some of you might not be familiar with, um, I am coming from the uh, the Jaffrey Fifth, so there may be things that I say which may be different. So, you know, of course, I'm not a religious scholar, so just keep that in mind. But um, uh, and I think from how, how I remember how Fitra is defined as this, it's it's not just, it's not your soul, it's sort of like that innate um, nature of the human, the way God created you, right? Like your Fitra is to want a mother's love, right? That's part of your Fitra. And um, part of our Fitra, um, you know, there's a lot of reason to believe is this love and desire and um, um, craving for nature, right? You you crave God, naturally humans crave God, and if they don't have it, they they seek it out, right? Um, and similarly, I think uh, nature is something that is part of our fitra, and, um, and when we don't have it, um, we don't know what's missing, but I think it is a part of that, that um, what's missing in us. Um, and so, and I want to talk a little bit more about what I talked at the beginning, which is um, which is nature and children. And so there's an author called Richard Louvre, who is um, 
who has written really amazing books. And one of his books is called Last Child in the Woods. And it's a really um, amazing, like sort of uh, scientific and uh, it's like a paradigm shift for like thinking about um, what our world has come to. And he talks about how in the last 20 years, there's been a dramatic drop in how often children go outside, right? So um, of course he's primarily looking at our Western countries and things like that, but in general, right? Um, there's been a huge drop. So children today go outside very, very, very rarely. Unfortunately, the average child spends, I believe five hours a day on a TV or screen of some sort. And um, there is just very little um, time being spent outside. And when you, when you go outside, that time is just not enough to be actually forming a relationship with nature and the world, right? Uh, most children today will be uncomfortable, um, you know, with the, the sensations and the discomfort of being outside because they're not used to it, right? Um, there's a lack of, um, you know, there's a really amazing graphic uh, at this magazine, this anti-consumerism magazine called Adbusters, where they show these, um, these silhouettes of shapes. And so there's six silhouettes on one side and six on the other. And they're like, you know, name these, uh, identify these shapes and so the ones on the left you identify right away because there's a Nike, Nike swish there's all these um logos that you know right away and then the one on the right are like six incredibly different looking leaves but most of us probably could not name what that is right um once you start learning about it you're like oh, okay that's an oak leaf and things like that but um, if you think about the history of humanity like right like that was what all humans knew like you grew up and you knew what these leaves are, what the, the world around you is. And how do we think of it now, right? Like in the cities, to us, all these trees and bushes, it's like one blurry green background, right? We don't really think of it as uh, individualized in any way. We don't know the names um, of the trees. We don't know the names of the flowers. Um, so we're in incredibly disconnected, right? But how many two-year-olds you know who can immediately identify McDonald's, Taco Bell, right? Um, Nike, like all these uh, all these things. So like that I think is a good metaphor for some of the um, values that we have, right? Um, and that we instill on sometimes subconsciously and unconsciously and unwillingly even. Um, and so what Richard Loop says is that, you know, if we want to um, work on environmental if you want to save the environment, right? We have to start with saving an endangered species, um, which is the child in nature. And the reason this is your endangered species is because he says that, um, like, essentially that 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 passion for the earth, right? It it comes from the he says the muddy hands of the young. Like you know that child playing outside is going to grow up one day right, to be an adult, and there's going to be a generation of people, and if they've grown up with no connection, what are they going to be interested in saving, right, versus if you, if your child has grown up with, um, you know, what, what he calls those, the muddy hands and the grass stained sleeves and that, just that time outdoors, that world is intimately connected to him, and that is something that he's going to fight, right, he's going to fight like hell to save, um, and uh, so, uh, that's one of the reasons why I started um, a forest school and this was in 2020 and it was a really good time because I was homeschooling my kids and a lot of people were keeping their kids home from school and so I started this program I had about uh, six families and their kids enrolled and um, we would um, and, and my kids and we would go outside three days a week and so they would drop their kids off um, and it would be about three four hours outside and what we would do is meet rain or shine so you know not severe weather but just if it's raining you know you're supposed to just put on a rain coat and boots and just come anyway and it was all outdoors we didn't have any indoor setup you know because also I couldn't afford to like rent anything indoor but it was a forest school and so the idea is like you know the kids would come and we would have a little morning song and we would have uh, maybe a little circle time and snack and then the rest of the time um they would just be playing in the forest and so um we met in the same place it was a uh, brushy creek in Austin um but there's you know it's a um, it's uh, it's uh, it's woods, right? So we would meet in the woods, and they were not, you know, crazy uh, far hike. It was it wasn't too far from the parking lot, um, but we met there for one year. So the kids got to see this place in you know summer, fall, spring, winter. They got to sort of see all these um, cycles throughout the year, and so you know within a few months, you know when. Um, and when an adult came one day to see what, what it was, the kids just grabbed their hand and led them, you know, with no directions, nothing like just led them through the entire the, the portion of the woods we would spend our hours in um, 
take them all around and come back to the the end and they led the way they said you know this is we call this the buttercup valley because this is where the buttercups are and this is where the wild onions grow and just they had so quickly learned 20 to 25 names of some of the wild species that were out there and it wasn't because I had flashcards trying to get them to memorize is because they had experienced it. And so, you know, they'd ask the questions and I had found the answer if I didn't know. And, you know, and, and pretty soon they were able to find the wild onions. Like there's these, you know, wild onions that grow here and wild garlic. Um, they were able to identify all these flowers and make bouquets. And, um, you know, they, they saw how the trees change. They saw the robins come in the winter, you know, and all these things led to amazing conversations about, you know, um, the migrations uh, with animals and the, the relationships between things and how um and just it, it was just something that you you couldn't do anywhere else right even if I were to take them if you take them to a park one day if you take them on a hike one day right um they're not going to get that level of knowledge that these kids got just through forming a relationship with that land um and I saw a, a quote the other day that reminded me of this idea which was um by a Lakota chief is that's how it was written anyways um and it said um, it's better to know one mountain than to climb many. And that was just the idea of um, forming a relationship, right? Um, so that takes me into um, just talking about uh, humans' biological need for nature. And I think it's it's incredibly easy to forget how we are also, like we are mammals, right? In a way, and not to say we're just animals, but we're, we are biologically part of the world right and so we have a need for it um and we we don't really think of ourselves like that we don't really think of ourselves um uh, as any way part of the natural world um but we are and so um there there are so many studies out there and i can't even get into all of them um that just talk about how much humans benefit from time spent outdoors right there was one study that showed that, um, I think it was in 2019, that people who spent two hours a week, which is not a lot, in green spaces, whether it's local parks or natural environments, um, were substantially more likely to report good health and psychological well-being. But what was interesting about this study is that they found there was this boundary. Um, so this is all people who should have had about two hours or more, but they found for people who had less than two hours, who had one hour of nature time, they didn't meet, they didn't have the, those same benefits. They weren't reporting those benefits. And I think so what, what this study shows me is not just that it's important to have nature experience, but it's important to have time, um, like real time where you're not rushing your way through it. You're not rushing to get to the end of the hike and then back, right? You're actually allowing yourself to like actually be there and be present. Um, and that makes such a big difference. You know, just like the story at the beginning of the kids who, went on a field trip and you you did the nature activities and you left um, compared to somebody who goes out all the time um, and has this a much more different experience. You think you're having the same experience and you're not, right? Um, you're, you're actually are having a different experiences and, and you're viewing things differently. Um, so Richard Louvre, again, he says, nature is not just nice to have, but it's a have to have for physical health and cognitive functioning. And he says, it takes time loose, unstructured dream time to experience nature meaningfully. So the idea of what I was talking about is humans as mammals, right? Um, and I think this is a really important thing to think about. I think we do have a biological need, but sometimes um, sometimes some people kind of take it to the other, other end maybe where they'll sort of say that um, we are just animals and we're just, um, one of the, the cogs in this, you know, machine of nature and all of that. But I, I think an important thing, especially Islamically, is to think about um, the fact that humans do play a really unique and special role um, because of the way just nature works. Like nature is um, is beautiful and there's so much balance in it. And there's also a lot of like natural cruelty, like, the, you know, there are species that do go extinct on their own. There's, you know, animals killing other animals. It's all part of nature. Um, by the end of the day, like, all of these things in, a, in an ecological ecosystem, right? Like you, if you've studied it, you know there's there's so many 
interwoven relationships there, right? Um, between the soil, animals, like the flora, fauna, um, the weather, uh, microbes, the, the food chain. So for an example of something that, um, you know, well, we talked about in one of my naturalist classes, um, a cougar, right, which is a mountain lion, has a range of about 20,000 square miles. So that's one like solitary cougar. Um, and its territory is like 20,000 square miles. So it, it sort of roams and stalks this really, really big area, right? Um, and so obviously those kind of things get interrupted when human development comes into place and highways and all kinds of things. And that, that territory gets completely, you know, disjointed and things like that. Now, let's say that cougar is then hunted and killed because maybe he's getting too close to a neighborhood and people you know, are upset and scared. And so that cougar is killed. When that cougar is killed, right, in that range that it used to be at the top of the food chain for, there's now going to be a domino effect. So there's going to be the thing, the animals he hunted, right? Uh, let's say it was the white-tailed deer, right? So the animals that that cougar tended to hunt and um, chase and strike fear in and all of these other things, um, the cougar is playing a role in controlling that animal's population, right? Um, so what's going to happen? Now, those animals are probably going to increase in population, right? So now you have, let's say, a lot of white-tailed deer running around. What's going to happen? There's going to be a lot more deer eating plants, right? So there's going to be certain plants that those deer tend to eat that are now going to start dwindling, right? The plants that you have in a soil are going to affect the nature of the soil. So you, as you get down that food chain, um, what you see is that within a short period of time, killing off that cougar has now caused the microbes and the soil of that entire region to actually completely change. Like an entirely different bacteria is now predominant. And it's, and it's something that to me is like just so amazing. There's millions of these examples in nature, but uh, how things are interconnected, right? So now the difference sort of right and this is uh, not going to be phrased very well because this is sort of like how I'm putting my thoughts together is that is that humans we play a huge role right but we're not because of the fact that we're humans because of our intelligence right we have a very almost purposeful we can we can do things very purposefully that cause these huge ripple effects in nature um and vice versa we can do things purposefully that can save or undo other ripple effects, right? So we have a very uh, a unique uh, system. We're not just sort of like this almost unthinking part of the ecology, like a lot of these animals are. They're sort of playing these roles and sure, sometimes they'll go off the, their roles, but at the end of the day, they are part of that ecology, right? So we are part of nature, but we're also in a way slightly separate. Um, and the best way to understand that, right? And there's a really funny story actually on TikTok. <laughs> there was this one video that went viral of some guy. He wasn't even joking. Um, he was actually like a naturalist or something who tended to go out a lot. And he he was just like ranting. And he's like, you know, I think it's just so crazy how uh, humans play this like uh, crazy role in, in the environment. We're almost like this invasive species. And it just doesn't make sense like uh, how we don't fit into the ecology. I think there might have been like aliens, like I really think aliens might have brought us a long time ago, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, and, and so all these people were arguing with him, but just, I just thought it was so funny that he, he would like rather go to this explanation of us br being brought by aliens that then maybe the idea that we were created with a specific role, right, um, in the universe. And so, um, so now I'm going to read to you um, a surah from the Quran, not the entire thing and not in Arabic, unfortunately, I'm not the best at reading in Arabic. I'm going to read the translation of like the first 16 ayats of Surah Nahal. Um, and this is uh, just one of the translations and there are a lot of different translations that I'll give a few comments on based on some scholars, um, how they've interpreted this these verses. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The command of Allah is at hand, so do not hasten it. Glorified and exalted is he above what they associate with him in worship. He sent on the angels with a revelation by his command to whoever he wills of his servants, stating, warn humanity that there's no God worthy of worship except me, so be mindful of me alone. He created the heavens and the earth for a purpose. Exalted he is he above what they associate with him in worship. He created humans from a sperm drop, and then behold, they openly challenge him. He created the cattle for you as a source of warmth, food, and many other benefits. They're also pleasing to you when you bring them home and you take them out to graze. 
and they carry your loads to distant lands which you could not otherwise reach without great hardships. Surely your Lord is ever gracious and most merciful. He also created horses, mules, and donkeys for your transportation and adornment, and he creates what you do not know. It is upon Allah alone to clearly show the straight way. Other ways are deviate. Had he willed, he could have easily imposed guidance upon all of you. He is the one who sends down rain from the sky from which you drink and by which plants grow for your cattle to graze. With it, he produces for you various crops, olives, palm trees, grapevines, and every type of fruit. Surely in this is a sign to those who reflect, and he has subjected for your benefit the day and the night, the sun and the moon, and the stars have been subjected by his command. Surely in this are signs for those who understand. And he subjected to you whatever he has created on earth with varying colors. And he's, and he's the one who subjected the sea so that you may eat tender seafood and extract ornaments to wear. And you see ships plowing their way through it so that you may seek his bounty and give thanks to him. Um, so I won't read all of it, but some of the, the themes you might have heard is this idea of nature, and um, the bounties of nature, right, being created for us and being subjected um, for us. And so this is something that is really interesting to think about, right, because um, I think if you aren't very familiar, you might take this idea and think if something's subjected to us, we're its masters and we are um, can do whatever we want with it. Um, and that's not um, and that's not the case. That is not how. Islam views this relationship. And so um, so let me talk a little bit about um, how we can view nature through the spiritual and Islamic lens. So before I talk more about the Islamic lens, I wanted to do an aside and talk about Pope Francis because he wrote um, something in Christianity, uh, Catholic beliefs, it's called an encyclical, and he wrote one called Laudato Si. And it is very interesting and very beautifully written. It is this treatise on the Christian's duty to the environment. And it's really amazing and very different from, you know, what you would see right-wing Christianity in America. Um, and so some of the things he talks about in there is that we shouldn't be the masters, but rather siblings of nature. Um, and he talks about, you know, verses from the Bible, like um, the humans have to till and keep the earth and how we have done a lot of tilling and not a lot of the keeping. Um, and he says that if we approach nature and the environment without openness to awe and wonder, and if we no longer speak the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world, then our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs. By contrast, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. Um, he, he writes a lot about opening ourselves up in, in, in a way, like he talks about empathy, opening ourselves up to the suffering of the earth and hearing the cries of the earth. Um, and, in, and in this, um, and in the Laudato Si, he, he details a lot of the um, the evils that have been done on the earth and how humans are obligated to, you know, do something about it. And he, and he also does something amazing, which is con connect solidarity with the earth with solidarity with the poor and talks about how environmental degradation disproportionately affects um, the poor, the impoverished, and third world countries. Um, so this idea is not just um, in, you know, in Christianity. So this is a, a new sort of um, thought that he's put out there. But in Islam, there's been a lot of leaders who have also spoken about this, um, and a lot more thought that's been given to this in the light of the world that we live in. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about the scholars that I'm familiar with, but I'm sure you, you can find a lot of other examples. So one of the things is um, uh, one of the great scholars of our time, who is also a head of state in Iran, is uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei. And he writes about, and he gives statements about environmental destruction uh, will endanger the future of human beings. And he talks about the activities, environmental activities are religious and revolutionary in nature, and they shouldn't be regarded as luxurious or ornamental. And I think this is really uh, powerful because it kind of shows the importance of um, our, our role, that it's not just like something that's nice to do, but that it's fundamental to our identity as Muslims. And it's also revolutionary. Um, if you view yourself, um, this idea of like an, a Muslim is a revolutionary, right? Um, there is another great scholar, the Adela Jawadi Amali, who's written a book called Islam and the Environment, which is actually available online. And he talks about verses like the ones in Serena Hill, 
Um, and he says the relationship between humans and nature is that of um, uh, sub viewing nature as subjugated, which is not the same thing as what we would think of, like, you know, um, in Western thought, versus coerced. And so uh, being subject to us, like uh, God subjects nature, um, and then we also uh, we also um, have that relationship with it, which is very different from coercing nature. And um, uh, Sheikh, um, there is a, a scholar that I know, Sheikh Trent Carl, who has sort of um, given me this way of looking at it. And he says that when you look at this verse, you know, you can you can also translate the word subject as uh, disposed. Um, so, you know, the, uh, when God says he disposed the night and day for us and they're disposed by his command um, is that all these natural phenomena, how we can interpret it is not um, is not that relationship of being the master or the controller or coarser. Uh, first, we know that it means God's authority is paramount, but God is in control of these elements and he's the active agent in disposing them for our use. And that God is the gifter of nature to humankind. He created them for our benefit. And then number three, that anytime there's a relationship between God and humankind, there's going to be a moral element. Um, and that means that um, we have to we have to look at it as um as an ethical interaction, like when you get a gift, right? The idea of how you use a gift um, respectfully and how you, you know, almost like an imanat in Islam, things of that nature. So we can view the, the idea of nature being subjected to our benefit as the idea of us having a responsibility to it um, and, a, and a stewardship of it. Um, and it's very different from the exploitation uh, understandings that exist. And it, even Aitla Duwadi Amali in his book, in Islam and the Environment, uh, contrasts this idea with the way imperialists, um, you know, um, in the in the global orders of the world um, and colonization view nature as something to exploit um, and, to, and to gain from without anything being reciprocally given back, if that makes sense. Um, and so, I know I'm probably running out of time, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on it. But um, there was another um, there was another verse. Um, I think uh, I thought Amelie mentions uh, the words of Prophet Saleh in the Quran, which was that God brought you forth from the earth and delegated to you its development. Um, and he talks at length about what that means um, to be uh, delegated for the development of the earth. Um, and and he says securing securing a wholesome environment requires that we respect the natural rights of the earth, the air, the water, the desert, the mountain, the plant, the animal, and other creatures and environmental phenomena, um, and that we have an obligation to protecting nature. And I hope I'm not just beating the, you know, hammer like too many times, um, but that I hope that my point is clear is that we have more than just um, a tangential relationship. We have a very, uh, we have, a, we have a strong relationship with the natural world and we have an obligation towards the natural world, um, both in our uh, relationship that we form with it and not getting disconnected from it, but also in um, the obligation we have toward its, as humans, toward its um, care and keeping, right? Um, and avoiding this idea of exploitation and coercion, which is not a understand, good understanding of the, those translations of the Quran um, that is against the Islamic idea of our relationship with nature. Um, so, you know, we've talked about all these issues with disconnect. And so what do they do? What What is the effect they have on humans? Uh, the effect is that we're living in a time with um, unprecedented mental health issues, right? And there's a lot of different reasons for it, obviously. I would say everything from, um, you know, parenting styles, generational trauma, um, like toxins, right? Blah, blah, blah. But a really, really big part of it, um, a big part of the, the mental health issues that we have, the anxiety and the depression, right? And, and, and certainly if you have those things for other reasons is exacerbated by a disconnect from nature. And there are so many studies to show that people who have mental health issues, who have who are suffering from depression and anxiety, and when they are spending a lot of time in nature, they are noticing a really big difference. And, you know, and, and to me, I would argue that it's just because a part of us is missing and, you know, in, in that, in that, um, the article I mentioned earlier in the wildness of children, Carol Black talks about um, 
sometimes you see these animals that are caged and like a bear like ripping its um its own fur out and acting like just really crazy and 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 you learn about that that's not what a bear does normally right it's because that bear has been like removed from its natural environment for so long that it's just doing these like it's it's depressed it's tearing its hair out it doesn't want to live in that cage um and so, you know, and she's particularly talking about children being institutionalized in school, but I think that it applies to a lot of us in a way that we're, we don't realize that maybe we're, we're sort of caged, we're, we're kept away from what our, our natural environment should be, um, that our, the humans have for hundreds of years, thousands of years been a part of. And so it's affecting us. It's affecting us in really profound ways, psychologically, our physical bodies, autoimmune diseases, all kinds of things, right? The human disconnection with nature also is, of course, a big part of the environmental degradation, the climate change crisis, and all of these things that are happening around the world. Um, incredibly huge ecological uh, problems that are happening. And so they're all connected. You know, our, our, if, you, if we talk about little things we can do, I don't think putting your plastic bottle in the recycling can is going to make a big difference if it's an individual act like that. Um, it has to really be mandated by the government in order to make a true difference, right? But that, that aside, if we're talking about individual things we can do, forming that relationship with the earth and the natural world, giving ourselves time there, um, and especially our children, is probably one of the biggest things you can do um, to help preserve some of that future for, um, you know, generations going forward. And and so, you know, in conclusion, um, I, I would want I, I would want to just reiterate this idea that we as humans are severely disconnected from the natural world um, in a way that is really unnatural. Um, our bodies and our children's bodies need the earth and uh, for our regular development, for our mental health. And each passing generation, especially here in the West, is even further removed. Um, simultaneously, the actions that we're taking are impacting and hurting nature not just for ourselves, but um, as Pope Francis says, um, disproportionately for those in third world countries, climate change um, affects people in third world countries, affects the poor um, in incredibly higher percentages than it affects us. And so we don't, we are the ones causing a lot of these issues and we're not reaping all of the, the consequences of it. And so that also gives us this sense of like disconnection from it. Um, and I think that healing our relationship with nature and reconnecting with nature and ensuring our children are connected is going to help ensure the future of the planet and ensure that we are protecting our imanat from Allah and that duty that we've been given as humans, as caretakers for the earth. Um, and, it, and I think this perspective and this uh, way of viewing the world is going to help us heal some of the issues of the day. I hope um, I gave someone things to think about. I'm sorry for, you know, my rush to delivery. I'm not a public speaker, but I, I, I hope um, people took some stuff away. And if anyone's interested in uh, any of the resources or things I mentioned, um, I'm sure I could find a way to get those sent to you. Thank you, everyone.